20 this week. Wow, absolutely incredible. You've been together for 20 weeks. It seems like it's flown by just like that. What, uh, have you guys practiced any balance from last week? Did anybody incorporate any new balance in their life? Did anybody find themselves doing this throughout the week at all? No? Let's reinforce the balance a little bit. You guys stand up if you got uh, heels on or uh, whatever, if you want to kick them off real quick. <laughs> Just do a quick little balance exercise to emphasize last week. So go ahead and uh, find your center and your posture. Take a deep breath. Get your posture and your spine right. Focus on your breathing. Fixate on one point in the room, something that's not moving. You know, last week we talked about incorporating uh, balance in our life. And, you know, when you think about how we live our lives, if we don't have balance, like that story I told about the engine that was out of balance that was constantly knocking and just, you know, rattling the whole car to pieces, uh, same thing in our, in our personal lives as well. If we don't have balance, if we're not happy in our job, then regardless of how much money we make, you know, it's, it's going to affect our lives negatively, create stress, affect our relationships, and then affect our health, and then create chain reactions. Um, same thing with uh, our health. If we're extremely wealthy and happy at our job, if we're unhealthy and can't show up and can't produce and perform, then we might find ourselves unemployed uh, pretty quickly. And nobody wants a sick coworker to come in and get them sick too, right? So there's got to be balance in all areas of our lives. So good job, guys. Commend you. Shake your legs out and have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Stillman, can you handle that when we, uh, when we do the easy Absolutely. exercise? All right, I'll let Stillman do the other leg and, uh, and balance us out. All right, today we're going to flex our muscles with willpower. Stillman's going to get us up and active. I uh, love this topic we're going to cover today. It's called Got Muck. So I'm going to let you guys guess what that may be about. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about nature and how we're all natural. So let's get started. Motivational message, Jackie Robinson, a great baseball player. He said, this ain't fun, but watch me. I'll get it done. This guy had a massive amount of willpower <laughs> in his body. He had a big willpower muscle. So we're going to talk about how to flex our willpower muscles. You know, willpower, I see it as an internal muscle. And even though you can't see it, you can flex it. And when you flex that willpower muscle, it gives you that motivation to get through the day, to accomplish the goals and tasks that you've set out for yourself, and to ultimately manifest your dreams into reality. So here's a few tips that will help you strengthen that internal willpower muscle. Uh, take one thing at a time. You know, if, think about if you're in the gym and you're working out, even if you're doing a well-rounded exercise that day, you're not going to be doing a bicep curl with one arm and a tricep extension with the other arm, right? No, you're going to focus on that one muscle group. You're going to concentrate your efforts on that. I think sometimes we tend to get overwhelmed. We have such a uh, robust and diverse goals list that you know, we don't have focus and we can't allocate enough attention to any one area or any one particular task. So get that razor laser focus, as Stillman says, and uh, put it on that one task at hand at a time. And then once you get really good and you start seeing success, that success is going to breed more success. And then we're going to start to be, become more confident and competent as we start to succeed with the smaller things. Make a plan for temptation. Think about what you're going to do when temptation arises. You know, if you're on a, on a weight loss plan and you drive by the Dunkin' Donuts on the way home, um, you know, what are you going to do when you get that urge, when you get that crave to turn in? How are you going to derail yourself from that? Maybe it involves plotting a different course from work to home so you don't you know, put yourself in front of that temptation. Um, you know, let's say that you, uh, you want to get some willpower when it comes to how you react to maybe your kids or your spouse is constantly running late and it throws you into a stressful state. So how are you going to react when you get tempted to snap and just yell at the person? Maybe it's going to involve, you know, do a little quick balance exercise or some breathing or take a walk around the house or there's all kinds of different contingency plans that you can have in place that can derail you uh, from your knee-jerk reaction and keep your willpower strong. And if you do blow it, you know, if you decide, you know, you just cannot do it without it, you're pulling the Dunkin' Donuts, or you're snapping your spouse or your kids, let it go quickly. You know, we're all human here. 
here. We're gonna, you know, make mistakes. We're gonna get derailed at times. Don't dwell on it, because when you dwell on it, what happens? You're still focusing on that negative thing you did, and when you're putting uh, energy and thought and focus into that, you're much more likely to derail again. Keep reminding yourself why you're doing what you're doing, why you set the goal in the first place, why you're trying to fulfill these tasks, and really ingrain into yourself what's at risk if you don't follow through. You know, what's at risk if you don't have the willpower to control your temper? Is it maybe a, a divorce and then a custody battle with your kids and then a tough financial road and all these, think about the chain reactions that can take place if you can't stick to that one task or that one goal. So that will really ignite your willpower as well. When you look at that ultimate negative result and say, I gotta get a handle on this right now. I can't snap, take the breath, put the leg up, do a little bit of balance. Recognize that every time matters. Now, certainly if you're on a good workout plan and you're eating healthy 80, 90% of the time, you know, is one donut gonna kill you? Is one donut gonna cause you to gain you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds? No. But what that one time does is, it starts to break down your willpower and it starts to reinforce a negative habit. So the first time you let your guard down, then it's much easier the second time, well, I blew it last week, you know, might as well go ahead and do it this week, and then all of a sudden you're establishing that negative pattern. Every time matters, just remember that. Everything you do, every single time matters. So one of my favorite phrases, it's uh, three words, reasons or results. And I think that's a powerful phrase. When we look at our lives, when we look at where we're at right now, we look at our bank accounts, our relationships, our job, the car we drive, all these things are results that we've produced in our life. Now, if we don't have the results that we want, typically we have a list of reasons or excuses why we don't. Oh, I don't have time, or I had this bad luck, or this happened, or my transmission went out. I mean, there's a long list of reasons. But in this class, we've learned that uh, three powerful letters DME. Anybody know what DME stands for? Don't make excuses. Thank you, Stolen. I love it. Don't make excuses. So remember the reasons are results, three words, and then followed by the three letters DME. Don't make excuses. Own up, take responsibility for where you're at right now. And if you don't have the results in your life, ask yourself why. And try to take those list of reasons and convert them into goals and willpower related items that you can tackle. I've broken willpower down to six Ds. And these six Ds, I think, are very powerful. All the great inventors, artists, um, thinkers that I've studied, uh, they all seem to have common denominators. And I think that virtually all of the great achievers started out with a dream. You know, Henry Ford had a dream to build a V8 motor. And Thomas Edison had a dream to create the light, light bulb. Now we all dream, I had some crazy dreams last night. But what, what is different about these people that succeeded is that they're able to take that dream and then convert it into like a burning desire with, within them that fuels that willpower. So think about the dreams that you have, the things that you want in life, and then what really gives you the desire to pursue and to chase that dream. And that relates to drive. What drives you? What is your motivating factor? Maybe it's to pay off the credit cards, or maybe it's to have a larger house, or you know, another kid at some point, or you know, maybe it's to move somewhere else. I don't know. What drives you internally? Number four, direction. Before you hop in a vehicle and drive, you better have some sense of direction uh, of you know, how to get there. If we wanted to drive from Daytona Beach to San Diego, but we didn't have directions and had no idea where we were to start with, we could easily end up at uh, dead ended at the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Ocean and never make it any further and drive around our, our whole lives and never make it to the destination that we want to reach. So direction is very important. And determination. Determination is going to uh, help us with the roadblocks. When we do hit those pitfalls along the way, when we you know, run into a road close sign, hey guys. So that determination is going to help us persevere and find an alternate course at whatever means necessary to keep going and going and going. I mean, Thomas Edison had so much determination. Remember the story we were telling on the basketball court? You know, it took him over 2,000 experiments and 10,000 failed light bulbs before he invented a light bulb. That's a lot of determination. 
Discipline is an important part of the equation as well. You've got to have discipline. And I think this is one of the most important aspects when you're working out or exercising, uh, working with a personal trainer to maintain that discipline. I know myself, I'm really into working out, but sometimes I'll be into talking more than I am working out, and I'll turn my neck when I'm doing an exercise, and there's still an out, Sean, neck straight, unless you want to walk around like this for a week. So, you know, having good people in your realm that'll help to keep you disciplined. You know, if you've got a passenger in your car, and you're driving by that Dunkin' Donuts, first of all, you may not want that person to know that you're having those temptations or those thoughts to go to Dunkin' Donuts. And then if you put the blinker on, they might smack you and say, hey, aren't you on a weight loss program here? So discipline's extremely important as well. Does anybody have any dreams, desires, drive, direction, determination, or disciplines that they would like to share? Anybody have all six in mind uh, that they would like to share with the group? No? Well, just kind of think about uh, some dreams you may have in your head. <laughs> you know, where you would like to be next year at this time, five years at this time, ten years from this time. Maybe it's a vacation that you, vacation time you've got coming up and you're dreaming about going to a certain place. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually pursuing one of my dreams next week. I always wanted to go to San Diego Comic Con. And I'm going. Nice. So, and then I also like kind of since I'm going to California, I um, went ahead and expanded on that and added a couple extra days. I'm gonna stay in Little Tokyo in Los Angeles, and that was also another thing I had really wanted to do. So I got to do two things that I really wanted to do in the next week. What and fueled that desire? What, was there anything? Well, in particular? I really like conventions, and that convention in San Diego is like the largest convention. And the most amount of people are going, and it's just going to be huge. And um, convention, uh, anime conventions are a lot of fun. Nice. So, yeah, and um, I make a lot of costumes and stuff for these things. So a lot of things go in, it, and I do have to have a lot of discipline because I have, like, have, have to have the costumes done in time and stuff like that. And I have to do a lot of planning. I, you know, two different hotels and. You know, I have to get like transportation and all kinds of stuff and the, the airplane and yeah, I think I hit everything. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for sharing. And I hope you have a great trip. Oh thank you. I will. Anybody else got any uh, dreams in their head or any desires they got cooking up that they want to share? <coughs> no? Well, I'm gonna turn it over to Stolen then and let him get us up and active. <clears throat> Stolen? Thank you, Sean. Okay, I'm going to take off a little bit from where Sean started. Um, the willpower. You know, you've heard him talk about time management, and we all have only a certain amount of time in our schedule. So, if we're supposed to invest in ourselves, and we're supposed to invest in our, our health, and we're supposed to invest in our fitness, so we need to remember that we need to take and put that at the top priority, whether it's the first thing in the morning, middle of the day, or at the end of the day. So we want to set ourselves up with that willpower to want to do it, and also the time management to do it. So we don't want it to take it so long. So the question I want you to think about is, what if you could walk across the parking lot in five minutes, go through a 20 minute workout, and walk back to your office in five minutes, it's only taking 30 minutes out of your time. Because we all say we don't have a lot of time to exercise. Is that one of the common answers, Anthony? That's the number one answer. Okay, Anthony's doing an internship here, so I'm gonna make pick on him a little bit. Okay, so <laughs> if we don't have that much time, and we could chunk it down to like what Sean's saying, to 30 minutes, what can we do in 30 minutes? Because that's manageable, it's friendly. 30 minutes goes by pretty quick. So five minutes you walk over, you get into five or six different key exercises to strengthen your back, to strengthen your core, your abdominals, to maybe do a shoulder exercise, to maybe do a leg exercise, and you could add maybe five to six uh, minutes of cardio in there with some burst training in there. So the willpower, the desires that he's talking about to improve our health, to get us to move easier and out of the cars, we can con condense it down to 30 minutes. You don't have to use all the machines. But what if you did 20 minutes, 
of exercise on Monday, 20 different minutes on Wednesday, and 20 different minutes on Friday. You could incorporate a bunch of different exercises. So think of it as that something simple like that. All right, so what we were talking about last week was what muscle group, who remembers? God? What was it? Shoulders. Triceps. Good. <laughs> Triceps. Good. Okay. All right. So everybody sit up straight in your chairs. All right. Remember, the easy, anytime, anywhere exercises are designed to do what? To allow you to be in your workstation. So if this would be my workstation, all right, and my chair is right here, I want to be able to stay right in this little area. All right. So we know we have our stomach vacuums we can do. The count is 15 seconds, right? We know we have our breathing, 7, 28, 14. We know we have those. We know we are trying to work better on our posture. So we're talking about our triceps. And in review, we talked about rolling our wrists to loosen up the triceps, all right? Especially if you lift a lot of things, if you play a lot of sports, because my elbows have been tender because I lift the dumbbells up. So you want to keep them loosened up, all right? And we talked about the wrist rolls, remember? We talked about rolling the elbow this way. All right. So today what we're going to do is expand on. Now remember, if you're inactive or as you're getting a little older in life, you may need to do some of these warm-ups. I'm just being honest with you because I remember when I was in my 20s, like Anthony, and I remember when I was in my 30s training, and I remember when I was in my 40s training, and now I'm in my 50s. And what I do in my 50s is warm up more as opposed to when I was in my 20s. So what I'm saying is, is you may have to do some warm up things. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the basics, breathing, stomach vacuum, then we're gonna do some triceps that you can do right where you're seated. All right, so everybody sit up in our chair, get your posture with your feet. Remember your points? I'm back in my chair, my feet are flat. You can put your hands wherever. We're gonna inhale for seven seconds. We're gonna hold it for 28. We're gonna exhale for 14. Why? Get the blood flowing. Why? Get the oxygen flowing. Why? It's like turning on a light bulb, all right? So once again, you're talking about the whys. Uh, he was, Sean was talking about why do you do something? Why are the desires here? All right, so we inhale through our nose. We hold it for 28 seconds and we exhale out our mouth. Ready? Go. In. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hold. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Relax. I suggest that's a great way to start your day in the morning. You roll, you get out of bed or you do it in your bed, you roll on the floor, you multitask. I've gone over those points. All right, stomach vacuum. The purpose of the stomach vacuum is to tighten our abdominal muscles, tighten our obliques and our inner abdominal muscles, okay? So what you wanna do is we're gonna take a deep breath in, your nose, you're gonna exhale, then you're gonna put your mind, okay? It's mind in that muscle group. My mind is in my abdominal muscles as I'm sitting up straight and I'm going to try to suck my belly button to my spine. We're going to hold it for 15 seconds. All right, ready? Deep breath in. Exhale. All right, suck that abdominal belly button in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Relax. Okay, once again, Protocol I suggest is trying to do about five of them, okay? It's intensity. I want to be able to do them real hard for five for 15 seconds, all right? And if you're lying down, what I suggest when, when someone's lying down is put your thumbs right underneath your rib cage and stretch them down around here to your pelvic bone, and then you can really feel those abdominal muscles contract downward. So that encourages a little bit more as you progress and do those, all right? And you should start noticing and feeling them a little bit tighter in there if you've been doing them regularly. All right, so we're talking about triceps today, okay? Now, everybody has a seat, a chair, pretty much in their area where they work. Now, the only challenge is you may have rollers on them, okay? So that may be the challenge, but I'll show you how you can do it with a desk. So basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a tricep push, okay? Now, the speed of the movement is four seconds down, 
Do not lock your elbows in four seconds up. But let us let me show you first, all right? So you're gonna be here, and what I want you to do first is I want your legs at a 45 degree angle, uh, a 45 to 90 degree angle, okay? So all you're gonna do, now if your wrists are tender, might not be something you wanna do on this position, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna put your hands on the chair, okay? And all you're going to do is come off a little bit. You're going to four, three, two, one, stretch. One, two, three, four. Okay? Four, three, two, one, stretch. One, two, three, four. And it's going to work your tricep. It's going to catch the back of your shoulders a little bit. It's going to catch between your shoulder blades. So, do you want to try it? Everybody lean out a little bit off the chair. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, that's fine. Just watch. It's not fast, we're not doing it fast. All right, so your feet are flat, legs are shoulder width apart. All right, ready, lower. Four, three, two, one, up. One, two, three, four, don't lock your elbows, start down. Four, three, two, one, up. One, two, three, four. Okay, sit on the chair. All right, so we had good support with our legs. Now if you want them to go to, a, like the, that was the beginner. Okay, how many reps do you do? I would suggest doing anywhere from one to 20, because you may not be able to, let's say you're, doing, you're going for your 10th one and you have to stop, well, okay, today you got 10. Next time, maybe try 11, all right? Now, if you want to make it a little harder, you can just watch on the, okay, you're gonna put your legs out farther now, so now you got more of your body weight working, okay? So now it's four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, now, one thing you want to be cautious of, if you have neck or shoulder tenders, uh, tenderness, you don't want to go down too far, far. Go down what feels comfortable with you, all right? And then start back up, all right? So the range of motion downward is gonna depend on how your shoulders and your neck feel, all right? So that would be beginner, then we went to intermediate. Now advanced, you could basically just put your legs crossed and go all the way, and go down with one leg, supporting it that way. So now it's going to be a little bit harder this way, okay, with one leg on the floor. Or you can go a little bit tougher with one leg this way, all right? So that's a little bit of a, a variation there. The other one would use the desk now. Say your chair has rollers on it, you could do the same thing with your desk. Same movement. Basic, legs out farther, it's going to be a little harder. One leg touching the floor, it's going to be a little bit harder. So you have a beginner, an intermediate, and advanced with the chair. You could do the desk, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Okay? Pre it, I would probably loosen up my wrists and my elbows. Okay? So that's your triceps for today. Beginners, intermediate, and advanced. Sean? Thank you, Stolen. What's your why for exercise? Does anybody have a good why they want to share? Why they exercise or why they feel exercise is important? Stress relief. Stress relief, yes. That is incredible. Leah. Look good in a bikini. Look good in a bikini. <laughs> <laughs> Everything works better. You don't hurt as much. Indeed. I have a deep fear ingrained with me. I figured the strong the the more powerful the why, then the easier the how. So I had this uh, fear, I don't know whether it was a, an image I saw one time of an elderly person hunched over with you know arthritic hands and a hump back. I mean I I am terrified that that's gonna happen to me one day. So I, that's my why, why I stretch. Um, I'm also a little vain sometimes. I like to be able to go to the beach and the pool and take my shirt off and, and feel good about myself. And I like to be able to, to see you know, some six packs here. I've heard some very lame and very interesting why reasons from people why they want to do things. Um, so you know, ask yourself you know, what your why is. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, it's just real quick because I just read this yesterday and they were talking about not some people feel this need to have like a moralistic reason why they're doing something. And, you know, obviously, me saying why well, not look good in a bikini, which is true, that's there's not, nothing moral about that. That's just like, I want to look good in a bikini. And sometimes it's like those are the things that you have to use to drive you. Like, if that's what really drives you, then that's what you need to tell yourself. Like, of course, I want to be healthy. And of course, you know, I want to be able to like, stay healthy for kids to be active and not have some of the issues that my, I've seen my family go through and God knows there's a ton of stuff they've all been through but 
you know, sometimes those non-moralistic motivators are okay to keep at the forefront of your mind as well, because yeah. they really do <laughs> motivate sometimes. I had, a, I had a crazy, I was interviewing a, a new prospective coaching client to find out, you know, a little needs assessment if I could help him, if, if he, he could help me. Very professional guy and was wearing a suit. And he had a weight loss uh, goal that he had set. And I asked him what his why was. And I totally wasn't prepared for what he said. He said, well, when I'm in the shower, I want to be able to look down and see my feet. The only difference is he didn't say feet. So um, <laughs> it threw me for a loop. I wasn't expecting it. But I thought to myself, man, that is a powerful why. You know? That is it's a very powerful why. So think about how you can make your why strong, how you can really seriously incorporate it. It's okay to admit if you're a little vain. I mean, Leo will tell us sometimes I'll pass by a mirror and, you know, or when I put on my jeans, I'm like, uh oh, this is a little bit tight. And that's when I throw the brakes on right then and there. I drop the anchor and I say, okay, whatever it takes, that pound and a half or that five pounds is coming off. Got muck. Interesting topic today. Milk does the body good, right? It's Not so much. Uh, you know, marketing. marketing companies are great. In fact, DME here, excellent marketing company. I mean, wow. Uh, some, of the, some of the things that, that we can put a spin on, it's just incredible. The power of words, the power of imagery, social media, all these different marketing tools we have. And, you know, what's one of the number one things that fuels that marketing? It's money, right? And when you throw a lot of money at something, you can get a lot of results, right? Stacy and Steve, if I told you guys, hey, I got a million dollar budget and uh, I need a call center and you go, you can make some crazy stuff happen for a million dollars, right? There's a lot of money behind milk and there's a lot of marketing that's been put into milk and milk is on the food pyramid. I remember back in school, you know, the four basic food groups, dairy was one of them, right? Hmm. I kind of like to uh, use a lot of logic and common sense when it comes to my nutrition and what I put in my body and how I, how I live my life. Like Stillman said, you know, with, if you're doing these triceps and it hurts and you got a pain or it doesn't feel good, you always use your logic and common sense. So I started asking myself logically about milk. I mean, who the heck was the first person to drink cow's milk? I got this image of like some fraternity, like caveman fraternity back in the day, and they dared each other. <laughs> and they went over and crawled underneath the cow and like, you know, it, it, or maybe it was a bunch of, you know, cow tipping pranksters that decided they were going to take it to a different level or something. I don't know, but how did we start drinking cow's milk? We are the only animal out of thousands of different species on this planet that willingly drinks another animal's milk. We're also the only animal, the only species on the entire planet that continues to drink milk after we're weaned from our mother. I mean, when would you ever see a bull or a full-grown cow go up to another cow and drink from the other? It doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't happen. I mean, would, would you guys go and drink from a cow's udder? Of course, that's utterly disgusting, right? <laughs> it's got to be processed. It's got to be pasteurized. It's got to be refrigerated. It's got to be put in a carton and packaged and put on TV with a little milk mustache by a celebrity, right? Interesting thing. I worked for a staffing company up in Portsmouth, Virginia back in the mid-90s, and we serviced a company called Pet Dairy. I don't know. Do they have pet down here? It was huge in, in Virginia. Uh, pet Dairy. And uh, I had a couple of workers come back. And they, they told me that some interesting things about milk that I didn't know and some of the processes. But one of the processes in the pasteurization, you know, pasteurization um, you know, cooks the milk very quickly to remove harmful bacteria, but there's a bleaching process that had to be added over the years because of the mechanical milking. Uh, it created so much infection and pus and blood in the udder that the milk was coming out orange and red. So they had to bleach it. And I already had eliminated 90% of uh, dairy from my life at that point, but that pretty much, uh, it, it solidified that I would not be consuming milk anymore. Um, interesting experiment too, and I've never tried this, but I've read it from multiple sources, and in fact my mentor has seen me experiment. If you were to go buy a carton of milk off the shelf at Publix, pour it into a bowl, and take it to a baby calf and put it down in front of you, he wouldn't drink it. He'd turn his nose up to it. 
He doesn't recognize it because of the, the commercialized process it's been through. It's taken all the living enzymes, beneficial bacteria, all the good stuff out, and it's just this hollow liquid in the bowl that the cow won't even drink. So my question is, you know, if a baby cow who's supposed to drink it won't even drink it, why are we drinking it? And if you think logically, like I just thought, I mean, why, why are we drinking milk anyway? Why do we eat a lot of the, the stuff we eat? You know, the fast food display we had, and we basically proved that fast food is not food because decomposers won't even touch it because it's so preserved. Another common misconception about milk. You know, milk, it does a body good. What's the, what's the drive behind that if we were looking at 4 Ds? What's the drive the marketing uses? What do we need and get from milk? Calcium is the big one, that. vitamin D. Yeah, it's fortified. Whenever you see fortified on the label, label, by the way, something has to be robbed first before it can be fortified again. So calcium, it's, it's the biggie. When people say, where do you get your calcium if you don't eat you know, cheese or milk? Um, here's an interesting thing. Milk is absolutely loaded with calcium, right, Stacey? I mean, it has tons of calcium in it. Here's the, here's the crazy thing, it's quite an oxymoron. The process that our body has to go through to actually digest milk expends a tremendous amount of energy and creates a lot of acidity and a lot of toxic byproducts in the body. Now we've talked a lot through PEP about the importance of alkaline versus acidity and what happens when the body gets out of balance. So when you digest milk and cheese and butter and these products, your blood turns uh, acid. And the body is going to do every single thing it can to maintain an alkaline environment in your blood first. So guess what is an alkaline substance though? Calcium. Calcium. So your body's like, oh my god, we got this acidity going on. We need to throw something alkaline in the mix to bring it back up. And it takes calcium right out of our bones and deposits it into our blood and then it ultimately ends up in our joints, arthritis, et cetera, and in our kidneys and stones and it pounds our liver. And this whole chain reaction process starts just because of the acidity. So our body actually experiences a net loss of calcium through the ingestion of these dairy products. And please don't take my word for this. Uh, there's tons and tons of references out there. In fact, probably my, my favorite uh, book that, that talks about this is the China study. And they've done 8,000 experiments over years and years and years on multiple eight different countries. They've studied cultures in the world where they consume zero dairy. And they were hard pressed to find a single case of osteoporosis. The US is the largest dairy consuming country in the world per capita, and we had the highest incidence of osteoporosis. So the whole marketing theory that milk does the body good, that we get calcium, strong bones, teeth, hair. I tell you, I haven't had dairy products intentionally, you know, when I eat out sometimes there may be a little something in there, but we use almond milk at home, we use uh, Earth Balance, which is a, uh, a butter substitute. Love the almond milk, by the way. Everybody that, that we get on almond milk comes back and says, that is the most amazing thing you've introduced me to. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, cheese substitutes out there. There's a product called Daya that's uh, really good. It's a dairy-free cheese. It will be flavors. <laughs> So, you know, when they've studied these cultures that consume no dairy and they cannot find any cases of osteoporosis, and then here we've got all this, you know, osteoporosis problem and people walking around hunched over with weak bones and arthritis, I mean, you have to use your common sense and logic sometimes, and we have to just pay attention to what's going on, not so much clever marketing. Uh, hey, Sean, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, it's funny because you're saying when you put it into your body, it, it is an acid, but a lot of people say to drink a glass of milk, so it's supposed to calm your stomach if it is acid. I mean, have you heard people say that before? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, they say to drink milk, and Mike always says, that's different. Eat some ice cream, drink some milk if you have heartburn. Yeah. But isn't that, your, it's basically doing the opposite of them, right. right? Okay. Yeah. It does coat your stomach, that's why they change that. Well, yes, and we, we, I think we touched on uh, ulcers and acid reflux one time before. Um, you know, the stomach is producing a hydrochloric acid, which is extremely acidic. I mean, it's down in the twos, threes, very concentrated acid. So our digestive system, <coughs> starting in our mouth, all the way through our stomach into our uh, upper intestines, it's coated in an alkaline mucus. 
So what happens is your body, uh, for some reason, if you've got an ulcer, it's not producing that alkaline mu mucus, so your acid is actually burning the lining of your own digestive tract. So what would cause the body not to be able to form an alkaline substance? Well, maybe we're not giving it alkaline ingredients to work with. You know, if I hired you to, to build me a brick house and all I gave you was a pile of wood, you know, what kind of result are we gonna get? So like I think uh, Deborah Ann Lee just said, you know, when you drink the milk, it does coat puts a nice coating on everything, which we were gonna address here in a second, but uh, that might calm it down uh, in the short term, but really what it's doing is it's creating even more of an acidic situation in the body. Yeah, yeah it's like a, kind of a joke, a guy walks in the doctor's office and his arm is hurting and the doctor kicks him in the knee and says, how does your arm feel now? <laughs> Forget about your arm, because your knee's now killing you, right? So, uh, <laughs> So uh, let's see, got off the track here, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a uh, oxymoron. We drink milk for the calcium, but we actually lose it, and uh, it ends up in our joints and kidneys and liver in places it's not supposed to be. So uh, have you ever baked a piece of pizza, and you know, for, pull that first slice off, and it's ooey and gooey and stringy, and you wind it up with your finger, and it's all nice, and then you go back to get a second piece, and it's solidified a little bit more, and it's not ooey and gooey, and then, by the time you're done watching the TV show or the movie, you go back and it's glued to the pan and you have to chisel the cheese off. Well, think about this curvaceous digestive tract that we have all through our body. And if the cheese is that hard to get off the pan, you know, at room temperature or even, you know, 80, 90 degrees, the pan can still be a little warm and it's still stuck to it. Uh, imagine how hard it is to get all of that gooey, gooey goodness out of our intestines. So, you know, everybody knows you eat too much cheese and you might have a roadblock taking place in your intestines. You might end up constipated. But it actually, it plugs us up in another way too. It can actually cause the reverse situation. Uh, the colon's main job is, does anybody know what the colon's main job is? Small intestines handle the majority of that, but yes, the... Oh wait, that's it. It's the toxins. Yeah. What? water, yeah, it pulls the water back out and recycles the water back into our bodies. So what happens is when the colon gets coated and impacted with this gooey, gooey you know, milky dairy substance, it can no longer do its job. It can't, the small intestines can't absorb uh, the nutrients properly because they're all coated and impacted, and then the large intestine can't absorb the water, so then you end up with the opposite problem. You end up with irritable bowel syndrome or di diarrhea. Um, you know, I, I have a theory that everybody is lactose intolerant. Some people are just much worse than others and their symptoms are very evident to them. Other people, the symptoms aren't quite as severe and they just don't recognize that that, that's, uh, that, that problem is going on. <clears throat> it's estimated that the average American has about 15 pounds of stuff, I'll say stuff, impacted in them. If you do work out hard, I have clients that are in very good shape, they just have a little pooch that they just can't get rid of. No matter how many sit-ups they're doing, no matter what, they got a little pooch there and they always feel a little bit bloated. Uh, it could be that you have some you know, impaction going on within you. So how do you handle that? Um, you know, if you're gonna eat cheese and you're gonna splurge every once in a while and eat a pizza, then basically you need to cleanse yourself afterward. And uh, I have a salad that I do, it's called a sweeper salad. And it is four ingredients. It's uh, grated purple cabbage, shredded carrot, chopped celery, and shredded beet. And this is a very, very roughage dense uh, meal. And you wanna eat about a fist sized portion of it. So you look at your fist, however big it is, and a fourth of it's gonna be celery, a fourth of it's gonna be beet, a fourth of it's gonna be carrot, a fourth of it's gonna be purple cabbage. And then you have your choice for two different dressings that you can put on it. You can cut a fresh orange in half, and squeeze the orange on top of it and mix it around. That's one option. The second option, if you like a, a saltier taste, would be to get Bragg's amino acids. It has a salty, uh, it's a healthy version of a soy sauce, but it has a salty kind of soy flavor. And you can put that on instead of the orange juice and mix it up. Now, this is not a, a salad that's gonna keep you running to the bathroom all day. This is gonna be like a bulldozer going through you that's just gonna rake a lot of that impaction out of you. And uh, it's gonna be a very, solid and, and dense uh, movement, so to speak. Um, there's other things you can do as well. You know, if you, if you get, uh, if you feel like you're really clogged up, really impacted, you can go the route and get a colonic. 
Um, a water fast or juice detox will also help to your intestines to shed uh, some of that waste, to shed the lining, and to, to rid itself of those toxins that you may be packed up with. Is this making sense to you guys? Are you, are you guys following me? Anything that I'm saying about milk not make sense logically? Anybody have their own thoughts they want to share? Stacy, I know you're passionate about about the dairy. I think you pretty much covered it all. Cool. Oh, yeah. Yes. And totally about the people not knowing. I know I have been lactose intolerant my whole life and just didn't realize it because it just got a little worse, a little worse, a little worse. Yeah. You know, we only get sick sometimes when I was younger. It just, it, it never knew it was also breaking my face out, too. Yeah. I would also say it's very mucus forming, too. Yes. Like if you have a cold, oh, I eat dairy. Well. That's a good yeah. point, Stacey. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mm -hmm. yep. I had severe seasonal allergies about the first 20, 21 years of my life up in Virginia. I would get them in the spring and get them in the fall. It was so bad sometimes I couldn't leave the house. And I didn't put two and two together until after I changed my diet and I realized all of a sudden my allergies were almost non-existent. And through my research I found that you know milk and dairy products uh, are loaded with histamines. You know, when we get sick, we get a cold, or we have allergies, we take an antihistamine. So, you know, if you're constantly putting histamines in your body, that's the reaction that's going to take place. So, you know, it causes your body to overreact to, uh, to um, uh, foreign substances. So, if you don't have all these histamines to create all that mucus, when you breathe in the pollen, you know, you may sneeze, or you may have, you know, a little itchy eye or something, but you're not going to have a constant, you know, flood of mucus and uh, all the congestion that you would have if you're living on Nature is natural. Like the analogy I used, you know, drinking from a cow's udder, it just doesn't feel natural. You know, if, you, if you're walking through the woods and you see a flower, it's natural to, to pick it and enjoy the beauty, or if you see, you know, some, an apple or some berries or something growing, it feels natural to, to pick that and, and eat that. I want you guys to imagine for a moment, just take away every single thing that you know that's man-made from this world. I don't know how far back in time we would have to go, but imagine that, you know, clothes have never been invented, shoes never only had any love your shoes, right? Cars, buildings, all these things. Imagine everything man-made just vanished. No razors, no soap, no shampoo, no deodorant, all these things like, what would the world be like? How would we live? How would we feel? Would we be better off? Would we be worse off? If we had never experienced all the, the creature comforts we had today, we wouldn't know any different, but how would our lives be? It's interesting to, to ponder that. Now, fast forward into reality. We've got all these modern conveniences, and believe me, I am not one to suggest giving these things up. In fact, I just got a new phone. I love it. It made my life so much easier. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't have these visuals, and I wouldn't be standing here if we didn't have the modern conveniences geniuses that we have. So realistically, I don't expect anybody to give these things up, but what would you do if your life depended on it? If you could see into the future and you could see yourself having a heart attack next year, would that be a strong enough why to motivate you to not eat any more dairy or eat any more fast food? Envision, you know, you're laying on the floor, your loved one's over top of you, that telling you the ambulance is on the way, and you got an elephant standing on your chest, and you're like, what the heck happened? I mean, when you envision that, that's that's pretty powerful. Or fast forward a couple of more years, and you got a splitting headache that won't go away. You go to the doctor, and you're diagnosed with brain tumor, and they say, well, how often do you talk on your cell phone? You know, is it worth not talking on your cell phone? Well, maybe we can do alternative things. I like to put mine on speakerphone, sit on the desk so it's not right up on top of my face. I use a Bluetooth, which is probably still not good, but I think it's better than having the whole phone right up to your head. And I like to detach myself from technology and go out into nature. When I take a walk, sometimes I'll take a digital recorder, but I'll leave the phone and other things behind. It help to de-stress my mind and to uh, really connect with nature. I gave up fast food 15 years ago. I gave up that modern convenience technology. Haven't had a single fast food meal, I don't think, in probably 17 and a half years. And I tell you, I never, ever missed it. 
been a vegetarian for 17 years now as well. Don't miss me. That's meat and dairy or a technology that I don't miss. Um, I quit drinking chemically treated tap water. And I very rarely will ever get heartburn. If I eat at a restaurant and I have a, um, a glass of tap water, I can tell. You know, it's tap water right away and I'll get a mild heartburn. So I prefer the Zephyr Hills and the Fiji now. It's a good technology, you know, if I had, if we were back before man-made stuff, we'd all be drinking out of streams like beer and other animals, but, you know, you, uh, you go with a good technology. Technology also knows how to bottle Coca-Cola and bottle beer as well, but you got to make the right choices when it comes to what technology you're going to use. Um, I do still drink alcohol on occasion, but what I do is I implement the technology of drinking a lot of water, something natural with something unnatural to counteract those effects. So I haven't had hangovers and I can't remember, maybe I was 16 years old last time I had a hangover. Um, transportation, once again, I know a guy that went uh, 16 months without a car and just rode his bike everywhere, got in phenomenal shape. Uh, and uh, when he finally bought a car, I was like, oh, so do you miss biking? He said, like, no, I'm so glad to have a car because, you know, it's a have to thing, not a want to thing. Well, with us, we enjoy biking just to get out into nature. It's an alternative source of transportation. When I lived in Richmond, Virginia, everything I needed was within a mile or two. So after six o'clock, I would park that vehicle and would bike everywhere. And I felt like I was doing good for the environment too. I was counteracting the pollution and the effects I had by driving and then making up for it by, by biking later. I also live by a very rigorous schedule, like you guys, like you know, we're all in the modern world, but I try to counteract it with more natural things like the breathing that Stillman teaches you guys to focus on. It's powerful how effective that technology is. Um, taking a walk in nature, connecting with our environment. Um, my mentor taught me years ago one of the best ways to cope with stress and to kill a headache and to stifle anxiety is to kick your shoes off and walk outside into the grass or walk onto the beach or walk into the dirt and just root your toes into the earth, into the grass or the sand. Honestly, I don't know how it works. I also don't know how this thing works internally. I don't know how a battery generates power. I just know it works. So, you know, nature is very natural and we're natural. We're born from a natural process, you know, from start to finish. We live a natural life. The problem is we've detached ourselves from nature so much that we lose our instincts. We lose sight of what's right and what's wrong. And we do things because other people or marketing or advertising tells us to do it, even though it's not necessarily the best thing for us. So I really invoke you to use your common sense. You know, if you see a big tornado coming, what's your instincts going to kick in? You're going to run and take shelter. I mean, that's a natural instinct. If it rains outside, you also you seek shelter. But animals in the wild are so in tune with what's going on in nature that they can actually feel the pressure change. They know before you know the clouds even show up that uh oh, big storms coming, and you know it's it's almost an eerie calm sometimes before a thunderstorm gets here. And if you're in tune with nature, I'll be out on a walk and I'll be like, well, I haven't seen a bird and I haven't heard a cricket, and I mean they're seeking shelter, and then sure enough, five minutes later here comes the clouds and it's lightning and pouring down rain. So try to tune in a little bit more to your instincts, tune in a little bit more to nature. When you're feeling stressed out, kick your shoes off, go outside and take a walk. Who can do that? Raise your hand and say, I can do that. I can, I can do that. Cool. Tangible takeaways for today, guys. I want you to, to list out your deeds. And do a little quick spreadsheet or just start a little notepad, maybe a page for each deed. And list out some dreams that you may have, and we're gonna email these to you uh, as well, by the way, the tangible takeaways. So think about your dreams, and then what turns those dreams into an actual desire? I mean, oftentimes we dream about a lot of things, but never act on it, because the desire is not strong enough. And then what would it take to drive you to act on that? And then what direction are you gonna to have to head? How determined are you gonna to have to be? And who can you incorporate, or what can you incorporate in your life to establish some discipline? to fuel that willpower to help you follow through. Number two, it's a big, I want you guys to try to go one week, just one week out of your life, 52 weeks in a year, lots of years in our life, but for one week without any dairy products. I'm telling you, if I can do it, anybody can do it, because for the first 21 years of my life, I was a meat and potatoes guy, had to have a big slab of butter on my big potato, 
Yes. You also have to read all the ingredients on everything. Just don't eat anything out of a box. Yep. <laughs> it's almost all got milk in it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Deborah Lee is right. So if you look on there, if you see you know any dairy type of products, it's actually a lot easier than you think to go without dairy. Um, if you go to a restaurant, the term you would want to use is, hey, I'm vegan this week. So that means you're a vegetarian with no you know, dairy products. Uh, if you're in the Publix, I uh, challenge you guys, try the silk <laughs> almond milk. Oh, it's so good. The vanilla is my favorite. We'll put uh, one of our favorite breakfasts is a bowl of berries. Raspberries and blueberries are on sale right now. I think strawberries are too. We'll just load up a bowl with berries, pour that vanilla almond milk in, and just, oh, it's incredibly good. Um, granola, sometimes we'll mix a little bit of granola with the vanilla almond milk. Mike Panaggio is in love with the almond milk now. He loves it. They also have a dark chocolate version. Um, so we'll make a, uh, uh, an organic uh, peanut butter and dark chocolate smoothie with uh, the green powder. It is, it's like drinking candy. It's so good. And then there's a, a, a non-sweet uh, version that's just a regular plain almond milk, and you can substitute that in for your cooking. Yes. I, I could probably motivate some people that give up dairy. Uh, when I first got completely off of dairy, um, in about, uh, I'd say two months, I just dropped 10 pounds. Boop, I didn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. I agree. I concur. Anybody else got any thoughts or questions? All right. It's in closing, I want you guys to, to close your eyes real quick. Just take a couple of deep breaths in and out. Just relax. Take a moment to absorb the information you received today. You've invested your most precious asset with us today, and that is your time. So thank, for, thank yourself for investing in yourself. And thank yourself for putting yourself first for the last hour. Thank your mind for opening up and receiving new information. Thank your body for every breath you breathed, every heartbeat you pumped, and every eyelid that blinked. Thank the workforce of trillions of cells in your body that are working together in harmony to keep you alive. And thank the universe for all the potential it has to offer you. And most importantly, thank you for being you. So guys, open your eyes. Knowledge is power. We've empowered you today. And the gift is now yours. What you choose to do with it is up to you. Remember, insanity states what? We're going to continue doing things the same way and expect different results. But in PEP, we say don't be insane. Because folks, I honestly, truly believe that anybody has a power and potential to change any aspect of their life with one split second of thought, which changes our feelings, changes our course of action, and then delivers the results that we want in life. So my question to you is, do you have the results you want? If they were where you were looking for them, you'd already have them, right? So do you? So think about those six Ds and write them down. When, when is the best time to change? Yeah. And where should we start? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's close out with some positive words. So everybody got their affirmations of growth card? Let's start on the wealth side first. On three, after me. Ready? One, two, three. I am appreciative of time and every moment I am alive, especially now. I invest my time daily in my most valuable asset, me. I am grateful for everything in my life, whether it's a blessing or a challenge, tremendous or tiny. I am a motivated, self-starting doer who shuns procrastination and hesitation. I will use my experiences, whether good or bad, right or wrong, to evolve, learn, gain wisdom, and grow. Health side on three. One, two, three. I may not be a doctor, but I'm earning my PhD and practicing health daily. I will underwrite my own insurance policy and do everything possible to maximize my life and protect my health. I will achieve wellness in my life and balance in my life. I realize that my greatest wealth is in my health and I strive to become healthy every day. I am strong, beautiful, unique, energized, and passionate, and I'm getting healthier and happier and more successful day by day. Turn to your neighbor, give him a high five, and say, life is good. Life is good. Life is good. Life is good.